So I can separate from the love you give. I put my hope in everything that you Did you know that God has plans for you? Amen. Even tonight, God got His plans for you, for me. I'm excited about that. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That says it all. You know, if we seek God with all of our heart, he, we will find him. And he's got plans for us. Plans to prosper, not to harm us. And you know, you know what it takes for my kid to, for me to pick him up on my hand? Just reach his hands up to me. And that's it. He doesn't have to say a word. He doesn't have to do much for, for daddy to pick him up. Amen? Do you want your dad to pick you up on your hand, on his hands tonight? Well, that's, that's his plan. He's got plans for you. So just welcome. Open your heart. Raise your hands. Uh, come up closer up here. There's a lot of room. Don't, don't sit in the back. Just come up closer up here. 
Uh, God bless you.
worshiping God in this moment. We're going to press into him. And if you feel there's some kind of a disconnect in this moment, I just wanted to t- talk to everybody here in this moment. That, like the brother spoke in the beginning, there's a calling and a purpose. You've been set apart from the day of your birth. God has known you. He has loved you. And he wants to use you. We're just going to continue singing this song. And then we go into the next one. There's going to be a song of declaration of who God is, who we believe he is. The Savior, the everlasting Father, the creator of the universe. And at any point in this time when we're going to be singing, we're going to be pressing into God. If you don't feel like you're feeling that love of God, if you're not feeling that you can sing these words and mean them, I invite you guys to come up to the front. There's something so special in the power of prayer when the church comes together and they pray individually for every single person. We're going to continue worshiping him. We're going to declare who he is in our life. We're going to declare our belief and our faith in him. And at any moment, you guys can feel free to come up and we'll pray for you as one family, as one body, as one church.
saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again i believe in the name of jesus i believe in life eternal i believe in the virgin birth i believe in the saints communion resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus Father we thank you we thank you for your son we thank you for your son that came and died for each and one of us he went on that cross to take my sin, to take the sin of the whole world. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you died for us and rose from the dead to call us own. And we believe that you're here in this church tonight. We thank you that you care for each and every one of us thank you Jesus that you have purpose for us that you have a plan for us and when we seek you with the whole heart you will we will find you and that you have a purpose for us to prosper us not to harm Jesus we need you we need you tonight Please and come and visit with every one of us. We, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for being here tonight. Jesus, please speak to us. Jesus, please touch us. Touch our hearts. We need you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here tonight. Worshiping you. Open up our hearts when we're going to listen to the word that you prepared for us. The plan you got for us tonight, Lord, I ask you that you would bless every heart. 
you would open up every mind every year every ear to listen and to absorb your word into our hearts I ask you that you bless the brother that came to speak to us tonight I believe that Holy Spirit has been leading him this way and he's gonna share the word that you placed on his heart and I ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless the church tonight in the name of Jesus we pray amen please be seated I'd like to welcome brother Roman for coming and speaking to us tonight and I'll just give him the microphone God bless you. awesome thank you good evening everybody how are you guys feeling you gotta come a little bit more alive I want you to get up one more time if I may ask you and how many of you guys know that church is not a building but church is a body of people and we make up the church so would you take some time get out of your rows and go ahead and say hi to a few people and tell them a couple encouraging words uh, who knows maybe you'll meet somebody All right, all right, all right. I know you guys love each other. Go back to your seats. Um, it is a privilege and an honor for me to be here tonight. It's my first time with you guys. And uh, I got to see the church and the building and just what God is doing in this house. And got to sit with some of your leaders. And it's, it's an amazing thing, you know. Um, you're really part of something bigger. Amen. And uh, God is a generational God. He's the God who calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And um, everything God does is generational. And it's awesome to see a younger generation that is so uh, passionate and just uh, after the heart of God. And I believe that God desires to use that for his glory. And, you know, every time, every season is unique in itself and is different from the previous. But in every season, God fulfills a specific purpose. And you know, like we even have seasons in creation, like fall, winter, and all that stuff. Some of you might not like the fall, like me, the rain and all that stuff. But you know, we need the rain. And we need different seasons even when it's cold. Each season fulfills its purpose. And, and so I believe that God has a specific plan, not just for your life, but also for this body, for this church, for this house. And God is cultivating that, and now you're here, you know. You're here now, and some of you, or most of you, young people, you're here. And you might partially know the will of God, because there's the revealed will of God, and there's the concealed will of God. In other words, the will of God that you know, and the will of God that you don't know. But you're here. And what I want to say is, you're part of something. You're not just individually here, just individually trying to, you're part of something bigger than you. And God's been the one designing this thing from the beginning. Isn't that amazing that God created the earth, and before he even placed light, 
Before he even caused anything to exist, God already saw the end. And he created the beginning from the end. So you're here, you're in the context of time, but for sure God has a purpose and a plan. And for sure that makes you part of something. It didn't start with you and it's not going to end with you. But you're going to play a significant role in God's plan and God's purpose in this world until he comes. So I'm really excited to hear about some of the things that are happening here. And I know this is your second time gathering on Saturdays. And from what I understand, this is going to be a common thing where you guys are going to gather and launch this English service. And, you know, it's a step of faith. And I know that it takes work. It takes an element of risk. Because everything we experience in God, we experience through faith. We have it in God, but we won't experience it without faith. And so even some of the things that God is calling us to, we're going to see the manifestation of God's purposes by faith. Because see, what was read this evening before we started worship was, I know the plans I have for you. But you know that plans is not the end result. Plans is a beginning. God knows the plans, but the fulfillment of those plans is decided by you. You know, I love a phrase of one pastor who said that God always chooses your destiny. You didn't choose your destiny. God chose it, right? Because you didn't choose when to be born. You didn't choose your life. God, God planned you. God designed you. God chose you in advance. So God chooses your destiny. In, in, in John it says, I chose you and I appointed you and I called you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. I called you. You didn't call yourself. He called you. He's appointed you. He, he chose you. But the fulfillment of God's calling is decided by you. And so that's where faith comes in. And so I'm excited that you guys are taking these steps of faith and that your heart is for this city, your heart is for the lost, and your heart is to reach the broken. I believe that that is why the church is here. You know, the Bible says that the church is placed on top of the hill, not under, you know, covers of a table. The church is called to be the light, to be the salt, to be an influence and a transformation to this city. So I, I, I applaud your pastors, your leaders who, who are encouraging this and inspiring this. And I believe that this is a beginning to something greater. All the amends I can get, I'll take them. I'll take them all. I'll take them all. This is a beginning to something greater. And you're part of something bigger than you. You're part of something. And even though sometimes in life it may seem like random coincidences or like this randomly by chance just happened, but I don't believe so. Um, you know, it goes as far back as people who uh, try to teach our kids evolution that we randomly somehow just stuck together and became something. But that's not true. We know that God is in control. God doesn't go against our will, but he's in control. He has a purpose that will prosper. And he will complete what he started. He's the author and the finisher. And the good work that he begun, the Bible says, he, he's able to finish. So turn to the person next to you and tell him, you're, you're part of something bigger. All right, I wanted to read a passage to you in Isaiah before we start our message. That has nothing to do with our message. I really just felt like I need to read this for somebody. I have my friend with me, Serge. He's, he's the man that makes everything happen from Church of Truth. And David, he's a powerful worship leader. My sister-in-law, um, Aliona, and Jessica, her best friend that just goes everywhere she goes. And my daughter, Ava. She's my firstborn. Ava, come up here for a second. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> and so we're, we're, we're excited to be here with you guys and then some other peeps right here from our house and I don't know if there's anybody else but well the Mesas are like our extended family so um, oh you're, you're a one man show over there 
But anyway, so we kind of know about you guys and through the La Mesa family and, and through some of the people that we know here. But it's our first time here and we're honored to be here. You know, it's interesting what God says in Isaiah 43. He says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waters, and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a uh, smalling um, candle wick. So he's talking about his greatness. You know, how many of you guys read the story about how God led his people out of Egypt, right? I mean, you're talking about miracles. You're talking about the power of God displayed. But listen to what he says here after he describes this. He says, but forget all that. Turn to the person next to you and tell him, forget all that. Why is he saying that? And what does he mean by forget all that? Forget the miracles that God did? Forget the, the, the sea that he split? Forget the things that God created in their path, in their way? What he was talking about is sometimes we can begin to live off of yesterday's miracles. Yesterday's word. Yesterday's breakthrough. And sometimes that can get in the way of what God wants to do today. What God wants to do in the now, in the moment. So he's saying, forget all that because it is nothing. Say with me, nothing. It's nothing compared to what I am going to do. Isn't that interesting? God did so many miracles, but he had to speak to his people and say, hey, stop looking back to what I did. Stop talking about what I did. Look ahead. Fix your eyes on the now and watch what I'm going to do now. How many of you guys know that God is progressive in our life? That he moves us from faith to faith, from glory to glory? That God is always progressive. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes we park in yesterday's miracle. We park in how God used to move in a previous generation. But listen, you're in the now and God appointed you for such a time as this. And it's time to embrace some of the things that God desires to do today. Today. And you know, everything that God is going to do He's going to do it through you. God is looking for a man. God is looking for a woman. God is not looking for qualified people. God is looking for willing people. People that will make themselves available. There is nothing that God did on earth from Genesis to Revelation without involving a person. So we know that today we are the body of Jesus Christ. We are the manifestation of the tangible glory of God. We move on this earth as the Lord's body. That body is the church. The life of that body is the Holy Spirit. So he's living through us. The Bible even says this passage that just bobbles my mind. As Christ is in this world, so are we. What does that mean? Is that a spiritual phrase or is that really real? And Jesus even said, hey, the works I did, you're going to do. And even greater works you're going to do. Maybe that was a charismatic exaggeration. You know, maybe Jesus, Jesus just kind of like went overboard on that phrase. No, I think Jesus knew exactly what he meant and he meant exactly what he said. And the reason why he said something like that was not because the 12 disciples were so perfect. Because remember, they all denied Jesus. They were not perfect. But the reason why he said that is because of this qualifying factor that he was looking ahead and seeing you through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, accomplishing the supernatural. 
Because that's what qualified us. In 2 Corinthians it says that I enabled you and I qualified you. So we are the church. We are the body. And we are part of something bigger. And as we look back and we, as we allow to have some of those miracles and some of those stories feed our faith today, we also need to have moments when we forget that and embrace what God is doing in the now. We can't build a shelter or an altar or a tent where God used to be yesterday. Because God is always moving. The Bible says that he makes all things new. He says, behold, I make all things new. And I, I want to allow the Holy Spirit to really stir a fresh hunger in us to hear God's voice. Because God is relational. You know who he is? He is love. He is passionate about relationship with you. So he's relational. He wants to speak. But sometimes we're so content with what we heard yesterday, with, with what our parents told us. But God wants to speak to us. God wants to give you a word. God wants to flip your life upside down. God wants to reveal himself as the almighty in your life. God wants to display his power and his miracles through your life, in your schools, in your colleges, in this city. So he says, forget all that. It's almost like unholy, right? How can you forget what God used to do? Because it's so holy and we worship some of the things that God did yesterday. But you know that God is not just in the past. God is in the now and God is in the future at the same time. He is yesterday, today, and forever the same. For I am about to do something new. Say with me, new. So God is saying, forget all that. Forget all the stuff I did because I'm going to do something new. And this new is not going to be like it was in the past. He says, see, I already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry, waste land. In other words, what God is saying is, I'm going to do something new, but it's not going to be the way I moved yesterday. I'm going to do something new. It's not going to be in a place where you expect it. I'm going to cause rivers to flow in a desert. It's like, that's not even logical. Because he's God. And it's interesting about God that he displays himself in some of these places and spaces where you think he would never show up. Because he wants you to acknowledge that it's him. I believe that God desires to do something fresh, something new in this house. I'm sure this house has much great history. Uh, how many years has this church been established? 20? 25 years. And I heard that the building was built like 18 years ago. So you guys have a great building. You guys have a great foundation. And you guys are so passionate for the Lord. And I could see that your parents have imparted faith, a spirit of faith and righteousness and just a culture of honor for the Lord. But that's not the ending. That's a beginning. That's a platform to something more. So, so the parents played their role. And the, the older generation played the role. But, but you're going to play your role in all of this. Because your purpose is not just to try to save yourself. You know, being holy is set apart. But what are you set apart for? You're set apart for the Lord. So the whole point of holiness is for God to just pick you up and use you. Pick you up and move you. And pick you up and demonstrate himself through you. You're set apart onto the Lord. Because the Bible says we presented our bodies now as a living sacrifice. So you become literally like a vessel, like an instrument in the hands of God. And God wants to display himself. God wants to show up through your life. I really believe that. I really do. I want to read to you. From Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, open to Exodus chapter 3. 
and verse 1 through 8. It says here, and in this passage, in this text, I really begin to see how God, how this process works of how God calls us and how God speaks to us and what God does in us and what God does through us. Because, you know, we kind of grow up hearing this phrase, you're called by God and God has a plan for your life. How many of you guys heard that before? Yeah? Like, and we're like, uh, tell me something new. I already knew I'm called. I already knew that. But how? How do I find out? What, what, how, where do I go? What do I do with my life? And one day as I was praying about the same thing, I read this passage. It really just felt like the Holy Spirit highlighted this to me. We're going to read it together and show you a couple things that God was doing in the life of Moses. And to land you into this text, this is Moses who was born in Egypt, who was, one, who was a prince there. This is after he killed one of the Egyptians, was kicked out, went through the desert, ended up getting married. Um, and uh, now was shepherding sheep and living together with his father-in-law. And uh, this has now been almost 40 years after he left Egypt. So he was in Egypt for 40 years. And then he was in the desert for 40 years. And now he's about to enter a new season of ministry for the last 40 years. Okay? So we're picking up the text uh, where he's about to go from the desert into the ministry part of his life. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. So we know that the fire of God in this bush, the consuming fire, was gone. And the first thing that happened was not God speaking to him. But God drawing him. How many of you guys experienced the Spirit of God drawing you? He doesn't always just begin to speak to you. But he begins with drawing you. The Bible says that no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit of God draws him first. So the first thing that the presence of God does in our life is it, it stirs our hunger. Our desire for God. It almost like pulls us in. Draws us in. Because you know, we can't find God. We don't know how to find God. We don't know how to even pray. It's the Spirit of God that begins to draw us and stir us for the things of God. So we see the first thing that begins to happen in this encounter that Moses had is this fire consumed him. It got his attention. And he forgot about the, the sheep and the flock and the herds and all his responsibilities. And his eyes were fixed on this burning bush. And he said, what is this? I got to go see it. And we see Moses drawing closer. So I believe that the presence of God, it continues to draw us to the heart of God. And then we see as the presence of God, as he was exposed to the presence of God. As he was encountering the presence of God, he began to draw near. Now watch verse 4. When the Lord saw Moses. Say with me, when the Lord saw Moses. Okay, so this is talking about a response of Moses to the presence of God. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him, from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. When did God speak? God didn't just speak when Moses was in a distance. God spoke as a response to Moses coming closer. You know, my Bible says that if you draw near to God, then God will draw near to you. 
Some of the intimacy we experience with the Lord is caused by our response to His presence. You know, we can experience the presence of God on the outside but never respond. But when Moses responded and said, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to draw near to God. Then God spoke. Not before. And a lot of times, people don't experience the voice of God not because God doesn't speak, but because they don't respond to His presence. The Bible says He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And you know, I, I remember a friend who said, why is it like that when, you know, David, can I borrow you for a second? Like, you're seeking God. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, take a step closer. You can face me. I'm going to take a step, step closer to you and you take a step away. You know, and here I am seeking God. I'm drawing closer to God. And I'm praying. And I'm fasting. And I'm reading the Bible. And, and, and I'm doing all these things. But it feels like I, I, I'm, not, I'm not there. You know, I don't have all of God. How many of you guys ever felt that? And you're like, you, you taste God, you hear God, but you're not satisfied. And you get hungry for more and you keep seeking God, seeking God, seeking God, seeking God. And it feels like God is in the same distance with you. And I heard a friend of mine, thank you, he said, because God is not just interested in you having him, but he's interested in leading you somewhere. He's interested in teaching you something. He's interested in maturing you so that you can experience greater intimacy with Him. So to know the presence of God is to know His voice. Because God speaks from His presence. Right? If you're going to know me, like my presence, me in physical appearance, not on a picture, not on a bulletin with my name on If you're going to know me in my physical appearance then you're going to know my voice, right? You're going to need to know my voice if you know me. You can't know me and not know my voice. And Jesus says, my sheep, they know my voice. And they hear me when I call, and another one they will not follow. Do you know that our whole life starts from encountering the tangible presence of God? Christianity doesn't begin with theology, doesn't begin with, you know, graduating from a Bible school, but Christianity begins from a personal encounter with the living presence of God. That's where faith begins. Because faith comes by hearing. Okay, that's a personal encounter with His presence. Hearing. In other words, hearing His voice. Being in His presence. That's where faith comes from. We don't have time to get in all this. But we see that God responded to Moses coming closer. Some of you, you grew up in church. You know everything about God. But you haven't initiated to respond to his presence. And you're wondering, is hearing God even real? Is this whole thing that people are talking about is this even real does this really happen God wants you to respond because God works together with your will he's love he's not going to force himself in he's waiting for you sometimes we say that we're waiting on God but really God is waiting on us he's waiting he, and the Bible says that he stands at your door and he knocks and he waits because he loves because he cares. So he knocks. And the, my Bible doesn't say, I don't know if your Bible says it like that. But, you know, he knocks. And if you don't open, then he kicks the door open. Because sometimes that's how we believe God is. We think that if we don't do something, God's going to just kick the door open. Come in and say, I am God. I am boss. Do what I tell you to do. You know that God will never do that. Because then God wouldn't be love. God will never violate your will. But he wants to draw you. And you know, some of you who come to church services or even worship, you feel that drawing of the Lord. You know, you can even cry. You can even feel his presence from the outside. But listen, another 
a realm of experiencing God is to respond. And, and when he draws you to say, Holy Spirit, I, I want to know you. And, and, you know, we had an altar call. And that could have been a great time to just respond and you come. And, God, I, I, I want to know you. I want to know your voice. I, I make you Lord of my life. And you respond. And God begins to speak. Sometimes we just stand there. God, if you want to speak, just speak. I'm just, you know, I'll be around. But God will not speak until he has your attention. Does he have your attention today? Are you consumed by the, by the fire that's not burning up? Is the presence of God consuming your life? Is that the flame burning in your heart and in your eyes? Or is it just an experience? Because, you know, it was common for the bushes to burn in the desert. It was a common sight, but Moses looked at it long enough to see that it's not burning up. Verse 5, we're continuing to read this text, verse 1 through verse 8. Verse 5, God says, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. What is the first thing that God begins to do? He doesn't begin to say, Moses, go to Egypt. I've been waiting for you. I need to use you. That's, God, has, God doesn't say a word about the calling of Moses. God doesn't say a word about using Moses to deliver his people. You know what God begins to say? He begins to reveal himself to Moses. He says, Moses, you're standing on holy ground. This is me. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God doesn't just reveal his plan to you because, you know, God doesn't just want to use you. God wants to know you. And a lot of times we spend our life wanting to be used by God. And so much of that prayer is fueled by our own insecurities. God, use me. God, use me. Use me. Use me. Use me. And God says, I just want to know you. Don't seek to be used by God. Seek to be known by God. So God begins to reveal himself to Moses. Because, you know, the fruit of our life, the result of our life, comes out of knowing him. In John 15, it says, if you remain in me, then you will bear much fruit. Bearing fruit is a result of intimacy. Not a result of giftings. We can have giftings. You know, you can sing, you can preach, you can prophesy. That's all great. But bearing fruit for the kingdom of God is not a result of giftings, but a result of intimacy. It comes out of knowing him. Jesus modeled the same thing by saying, I don't do anything of myself unless I hear the Father. Say it first or do it first. And when I hear him say it and when I see him do it, then I do it. In other words, Jesus was modeling and saying, ministry doesn't happen out of not knowing him. Ministry happens from knowing him. Ministry is not a religious thing that you score points in heaven and, you know, become a, a little bit more loved by God if you do more for him. Ministry has nothing to do with that. Ministry has everything to do with hearing and seeing the Father and doing what you're hearing and seeing. But a lot of times, we're involved in dead ministry. Where we're just doing things outside of relationship. If you're living a Christian life outside of your relationship, intimacy with God, God doesn't value any of your ministry. 
you could, you could shout amen all day long because I am preaching the truth. Revelations, it says, I know how much you've labored. I know. God is saying this to the church. I know all the works you did. I know that you even tested false prophets. I know that. But one thing, say with me one thing. Just one thing. Just one. One thing I have against you, says God. You've left your first love. But God, it's just one thing. <laughs> Look at all the prophecies. Look at all the, you know, people I've healed. Look at all the, you know, how the church is growing. Look, God, I mean, you, you have to, I mean, you have to recognize that, right? And God says, no, actually don't. I have one thing against you, and that one thing is so important to me that if you don't repent, I will remove your lampstand. You know that first love in the Greek? You know what it means? I'll just simplify it. It means remember when we used to do things together. Isn't that amazing? God is saying to this church, you're doing works, but you've learned to do these works without me. You know that pride comes with that. And, and pride always comes before a fall. He says, you're testing false prophets, you're doing all this stuff, but you're not doing it with me. That's what he meant. So he says, remember when we used to do things together. That's what represented first love. And he says, if you don't repent, then I will remove your lampstand. So we understand that God doesn't honor what we do if it's not out of relationship with him. So don't think like you can score points by coming to church on Sundays and saying, okay, I'm right with God because look, I, I come to church for God. Come to church for yourself. Because you love him. Right? Right? So he begins to reveal himself. The next thing he begins to do out of his presence, because we need to go back to context, is God begins to reveal his heart. If we can have somebody on the keys, you guys have an amazing worship team. Where's that lady? Curly hair. Yeah. Yana, come over here. We're going to pray in just a moment. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a couple more thoughts and we're going to pray. Verse 7. We're continuing to read the same story, the same text. Then the Lord told him. So, okay, this is the next thing that begins to happen. Okay, After the presence of God draws Moses in, after God begins to reveal himself to Moses... The next thing God begins to do is reveal to Moses his heart. If we can just have it a little bit quieter and maybe switch keys if you can. So, let me say this phrase and I want you to, I want to have your attention right now. Not everyone that knows God knows his heart. Only the people that God knows, know his heart. In other words, not everybody who claims to know God knows his heart. But only the people that God knows, know his heart. Remember when God showed up before destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? He showed up to Abraham. And he began to tell Abraham all his plans. Why? He's God. And you know what the Lord said to the angels as they were departing for Sodom and Gomorrah before he began to speak with Abraham? You can read this in your Bible. He says, should I hide anything from Abraham? For I have known him. In other words, God began to reveal his heart, not to just any man. And not even to Lot, but to Abraham. Because, and he says why? He says, because I 
have known Abraham. Now we can say God knows everything. God is omnipresent. God is all knowing. Yes. But he has known Abraham relationally. In relationship. Because Abraham. He walked with God. He had fellowship with God. And God began to reveal to Abraham his own heart. Same thing we see begin to happen here in verse 7. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppressed of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their sufferings. Do you guys follow that word I, I, I? The Lord is talking about himself, right? He's saying, I, I, I'm aware. I've seen my people. I've heard their cry. I've seen. I'm aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. What is God doing? God is exposing Moses to his heart, to his pain. To his brokenness. To his feelings. This is what we experience in his presence. Where God begins to break our hearts for the lost. Break our hearts for people that are suffering. Expose us to what's happening in his heart for his people. It's a powerful thing. When God begins to do that in your life. Because that is where conviction is born. That's when purpose is born. Where you get exposed to the brokenness of his heart. And it breaks yours. You know that conviction is what leads your life. And conviction is born in brokenness. You know what conviction is? The day you figure out the problem you're here to solve. So there comes a moment when God exposes you. And let's say for this church, maybe this is what it looked like. We're good. We, we worship Jesus. We love the Lord. Our kids are good. We have this nice building. We have this nice carpet. We have all this good stuff. And it's just so jolly and so lolly and so great. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. But now, discomfort. Now, pain. About the city of Salem. About our schools. About our colleges. About kids that are committing suicide. All of a sudden, now, I used to be comfortable. I used to be good, but now I'm broken. And I can't look at this need the same. I am broken. Because God exposed me to his heart. That's what he does. And that begins to lead your life to places you, you've never, you've never thought you would go. You know, love will lead you to places you never thought you would go. And you'll find yourself dying for people that you've never met. You'll find yourself giving up everything for some kind of cause that other people will look at you and say, you're crazy. Why would you, why would you leave this comfort? Why would you give up all this money? Why would you give up this status? Because to you, the most precious thing becomes that and we see in the life of Moses what happened to Moses Moses gave up his life and spent 40 years with these people they complained they rebelled they murmured and Moses never left them he didn't quit two years into it he laid his life down to serve in a purpose and a direction that was not comfortable. He could have had a great life. He could have had a great flock and grew his possessions and his investments and enjoyed time with his wife and his kids. But he laid down his life. Something happens when God begins to expose you to his heart. And when your heart begins to break for what breaks his something special begins to happen and I know that even in this room some of you here you experience this 
You experience this maybe for orphans and your heart is broken for orphans or maybe for widows or maybe for drug addicts or maybe for children or maybe for a specific nation or maybe for Africa or maybe for America or maybe for this city, maybe for this church. But there's a level of brokenness that God has exposed you to and within that you will find your calling and your assignment. I remember when God called me to go to Africa when I was 20 years old. I didn't want to go to Africa. I didn't know anything about Africa. I just got married. I wanted to build my business. I wanted to, you know, plan my life. I was excited. And God spoke to us and called us to go. And I remember I went and I, I was there for a week. And I walked around. You know, we went to different tribes and all this stuff. And, and I, I saw how kids were starving from no food. I saw, you know, five-year-olds carrying one-year-olds on their shoulders. And I saw the brokenness and the need. And I was there for a week and I fly home. And it didn't hit me until I got home. I got home and I woke up in the middle of the night, my first night home after my trip to Africa. And I got up at like 3, 4 in the morning and I because of the time, you know, the time difference and all that stuff. And I come and I open the fridge. And my fridge is full of food. I love food. And I open the fridge. And I see faces in my mind. I see kids. I see these faces. They were nobody to me. I don't, they were nothing to me. They were nobody to me. They're not related to me. I don't know them. But all of a sudden, I see all these faces. I see all the moments. And I see how broken my heart is. And I remember that moment. I fell by the fridge. And I began to weep. I said, God, I don't need all this stuff. I don't need two cars. I don't need a boat in my garage. People are dying. And I was crying. I was broken. And I remember my wife woke up and she came out. We didn't have kids. I have four kids now. We didn't have kids then. And she said, honey, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing's wrong with me. What's wrong with us? She said, what do you mean? Like, you know, I was comfortable until God began to expose me to his heart. And then for the next 10 years, we begin to invest our money. We would, we would make, uh, you know, we would uh, make money. This was a crisis moment too when there was no jobs. This was 07, 08. And I was in construction, so we didn't have any work. We would make money and send money. We would sacrifice every month. We begin to build Bible schools and training centers and all this stuff. And I thought, what, what set me on this course? What set me in this direction? When God exposed me to his heart. And when my heart was broken, I laid my life down. I didn't have any other choice. I didn't want anything else but to lay my life down for this cause. God's going to do the same thing in your life that... I, as he reveals himself to you, he's going to reveal his heart to you. And when you know his heart, when your heart is broken for what breaks his heart, you will find yourself walking on water. You will find yourself doing things that are way beyond you, way bigger than you, and believing God. And I am telling you, you will see the glory of God. You will see the supernatural hand of God follow you. Because his provision is already there for you to accomplish everything he's called you to do. So he began to reveal his heart. He says, I heard the cry. I've seen my people. I've seen their suffering. I, 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 I. God talking about himself. And now in conclusion, verse 10. Watch this. He says, now, now. Say with me now. Now, now. Now go, 
When? See, you're released. You're commissioned out of the presence of God. So God drew Moses to himself. God revealed himself to Moses. God revealed his heart to Moses. And now he's saying, now go. Now go. For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. I thought we just read that God said, I will deliver them. I will rescue them. I saw their cry. I saw their distress. And then he changes it all up in verse 10. He says, now you go and you lead them out. Isn't that interesting? That what God wants to do in his heart, he's actually wanting to do it through you. He says, now you go and you lead my people out. And Moses begins to say, oh God, yeah, I don't think you understand. I stutter. I, like, I can't even talk. I can't even stand in front of people. I don't think you understand. I can't start a prayer club in my school because I'm really shy and I don't know how to put two words together. So no, no, no. I, God, I think you have the wrong person. I really do. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm sending you. I'm sending you. You go. And remember, down this road, we, we hear how Moses is arguing with God. And they're going back and forth. And finally, God says this. Okay, you get your, you know, Aaron, he's going to speak for you. Okay, that's all great. That's fine. But I'm going to be with your mouth. You know what God is saying? I'm going to be in your weakness. I'm going to be right in that place where you're stuttering. And you feel like God can't use you because you don't have something and you can't do something the way somebody else can do it. But let me tell you something. I've discovered something about God's sense of humor. And it's this. God actually chooses to use you in the place of your greatest weakness. You thought that God's going to use your strength. But in your strength, you didn't need God. God takes your weaknesses. I'm gonna, I want to use your weakness. And you're like, but God, but I can't. And God says, no, 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 listen to me. It's not about you. It's about me. And I'm going to be with your mouth, with your stuttering problem, with your, you know, communication problem, and so on and so on and so on. I'm going to be with you. Now you go. And I believe that God is commissioning and releasing some of you tonight to go. The Bible says that miracles and wonders will follow those who believe. Follow means they will manifest as you're going. Not as you're standing, but as you're going. You know, the first time I ever preached in my life, I got saved when I was 16. I was about to turn 17. My life was just a mess. I was a drug dealer. I sat in prison. And I saw friends die in my hands and all that stuff. When I got out of prison, a week later, my mom died. And that was the day I hit my rock bottom. I gave my life to the Lord. So I had this powerful testimony, right? My life was transformed and changed. And the youth pastor asked me, hey, you should share your testimony at the youth group. We had a little basement, about 40, 30 people, a guitar, no equipment, nothing, no speakers. And for a week I couldn't sleep. Just of the thought of having to stand in front of 30 people and say something. I couldn't speak. I had the shakes, the sweats, and you name it. And when I came up to share my testimony, I just, I'm saying this because it's going to bless you. Came up to share my testimony. And I was so nervous, I was so scared to stand in this basement in front of 30 kids that I got behind a wooden pulpit. My whole body was vibrating. I didn't look at a single person. And I was so scared that I opened the Bible and just read a whole chapter out of Isaiah and closed the Bible and sat down. You know what I told myself? I sat down in that chair. I was looking at the ground and I was thinking, "How God, kill me now. Just take me. And I remember, I remember what I told myself. I said, I will never humiliate myself like that again. I will never humiliate myself like that again. And it's interesting, right? Out of all the things God could have called me to do. And I, you know what I always told God? But God, what about that guy? Like, look how, look how good he is. His communication skills and the way he connects with people and how he just illustrates and how he puts things together. I don't even remember what I'm reading. I'm not the guy, God. And all that is fine. Your negotiations are fine until God breaks your heart. 
and you find yourself laying your life down at the altar and saying, God, I'm yours. I'm done with my life. I'm, I'm stepping over myself. Whatever you decided, you do. You know what God speaks to? He doesn't speak to who you think you are. He speaks to your potential and the way he sees it. You might, you might evaluate yourself based on your strengths and weaknesses, but God evaluates you based on your true potential. Remember, he spoke to Gideon, and he's like, Gideon, you're a mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, God, I, I'm the smallest tribe. I'm the least of everybody here. What do you mean, a mighty warrior? Me? God says, yes, you. You're a mighty warrior. I'm going to use you to defeat the enemy. That's what God is saying to you. You're a mighty warrior. You're here for a purpose. But everything that God called you to do will flow out of relationship. I want you to stand to your feet tonight. If I can have the worship team come. I'm going to do this altar call right now as we continue to worship and just go, go into this thing. I might ask you to, to respond to the presence of God. And to allow God not to just make you feel good, but to allow God to birth something inside of you. To break your heart, to expose you. And allow you to respond and say, God, I'm, not, I'm done arguing with you. I'm, I'm done negotiating. Here is my life. You know, like Isaiah said, here am I, God. Send me. I'm done making excuses. I'm done being scared of people's responses. I want to fulfill your plan. I want to be in your will. I want to be in your heart. Walk through me. Talk through me. Touch through me. I'm yours. Why don't you just take some time right now and just begin to just acknowledge the presence of God in this place. Come on, let's just all over this place lift our hands as a sign of surrender to the King. Just begin to speak, speak your heart to Him. Just begin to thank Him for who He is. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you, God, that you've known us. That you found us. That you loved us first. You didn't love us when we loved you. You loved us first. You loved us when we hated you. You loved us when we spat at you. You loved us when we turned our back to you. You loved us first. You desire sons and daughters. And we come tonight, God, not as slaves, but as sons and daughters. And we want your love to speak value into our life, to speak purpose into our life, to show us who we are, created in your image, in your likeness, to be like you. We worship you. We acknowledge you. I want you to speak to God, your own voice. Come on. Not, don't just listen to me. Speak to God right now. Just your own heart, your own voice. Holy Spirit. We desire you. We are hungry for you, thirsty for you. Lord, we want to know your heart. We want to know your heart. We don't just want to know your hand. We don't just want to know your power. We want to know your heart. We want to know your voice. Speak to us again, God. Pour out your spirit again upon this church, upon our lives. Pour out a fresh rain, God. We are not satisfied with what you did yesterday. We are hungry for what you're doing today. 
We are thirsty, God. Our hearts, our souls, they pant for you. And we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was, who is, and who is to come. You are holy. You are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of our attention. Draw us to your fire, God. Draw us, Holy Spirit, to the heart of the Father. Let every other thing fade. Let every distraction fade. Let all the busyness fade. Let all the dreams of our flesh fade. Let may you become the center, the consuming fire in our life. That we may see you with a whole heart. That we may see you with all of our sight. That we may have you with all of our attention. We shut the door to every distraction. We shut the door to every fear. We shut the door to every unbelief. We want to behold you. We want to stand in your presence. We want to be people that know you. Renew us, Holy Spirit. Speak a fresh word into our heart. We don't want to feed ourselves with yesterday's manna. We believe that today's manna is falling from heaven. And Jesus, you said that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We want to know the word that is sounding from heaven. We want to know the word that is proceeding the very mouth of God. Speak to us, Lord. Ignite our hearts. We want to burn for you, God. We want to be your people. want to be your people. And as we worship, I want to do this altar call right now. This is for the young and the old. Young people, you need the older generation. Older people, you need the younger generation. This is for the young and the old. God is generational. And I want you to respond tonight. If you want to make a decision, because see, the fire comes on the sacrifice, not just on the altar. If the altar is empty, the fire of God doesn't come. But if you are willing and if you are choosing to present your life to God as a living sacrifice, I believe that the fire of God is going to touch you tonight. And if you want to make that decision and say, God, I, I'm presenting my life to you. Use it for your glory. I'm laying down my life to go and to fulfill your purposes. And I believe that God is going to inspire new dreams, new visions, new ideas, new strategies. And that there will be ministries that will birth out of this house, out of this place, and touch this city, and touch the schools, and touch the high schools, and the colleges, and the elementary schools. Because God has a desire to save the world. And so if you want to respond today to the presence of God, I don't, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian or how much of the Bible you know. If you are hungry for more, I want you to just get out of your row and come to the front right now as we worship. Let this be your response to His presence. Your response to His Word. And say, God, I'm laying down my life. I'm placing myself on the altar. And I'm asking for your fire to come and to make me Alive again in your presence. I believe some fathers and some mothers will join some of these young people. Come on, let's begin to lift up our voices. Let's begin to stir up our spirit. Stir up a spirit of prayer. Le sora na mando sia 
Holy, holy. Come on, God wants to hear your voice. God wants to have your presence.
his way, miraculous ways here, and uh, she continues to show these himself to us, or reveal himself to us, and we thank everyone who showed up to help us and to worship God with us. Thank you guys. Is that something? Pastor Roman, who drove all the way out here. God bless you. Thank you.